tonight. Calling for change. Protesting doctors in India continue to demand justice as fear for the safety of female workers mount. Wild weather. Chaotic gusts of torrential downpours wreak havoc across Australia as the oceanic region is faced with one climate crisis after another. Paris gains. With early voting set to kick off, the numbers seem to be slowly but surely turning in favour of Kamala Harris's camp despite increasing calls for her to face the pace. And Mia Night Magic. Phil and friends get in touch with their ancestral roots at the Shanghai Museum, complete with perfect displays of kitten appreciation. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Ava Vedrana, World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here's Vinuth Warnasuriya. A very good evening, you are joining us on World News tonight as we kick off yet another week. Well, over the weekend, we saw a lot of updates to key stories we have been reporting to you on, from the tensions in the South China Sea to new data from road to the White House. But we begin tonight in neighboring India. The unrest in India continues to simmer as protests keep up across the nation. Well, postgraduate trainee doctors in India say that after a young Indian female trainee doctor was sexually assaulted and killed earlier this month, they would not go on duty again without carrying a pepper spray or a scalpel to defend themselves. Gauri Seth said she did not use to carry pepper spray and a scalpel while working as a postgraduate trainee doctor at Medical College Calcutta. That changed after another young female trainee in the city was sexually assaulted and killed last month. The murder set off nationwide outrage and sparked protests across India. Protests that Seth has herself joined. She says she's gotten more phone calls from concerned relatives and friends worried for her safety. According to the Indian Medical Association, about 60% of India's doctors are female, with three quarters reporting verbal and physical abuse on duty. The recent assault has drawn parallels to the 2012 Delhi gang rape of a physiotherapist that sparked widespread protests. 14 female doctors at government hospitals in West Bengal who described poor working conditions, including aggressive treatment from patients' families and inadequate resting facilities. Others described napping in break rooms with no locks or dealing with male patients taking photographs of them without permission. West Bengal Chief Minister Mamata Banerjee has announced a 12 million US dollar initiative for improvements in health facility safety, including better lighting and female security staff. Justice. Despite tougher laws introduced after the 2012 incident, the number of reported crimes against women rose to nearly half a million in 2022, with over 7% related to rape. Well, still in the region, the Philippines and China exchanged accusations of intentionally ramming Coast Guard vessels in the disputed borders of the South China Sea. This is the latest in an escalating series of clashes in the vital waterway. The collision near the Sabina Shoal was their fifth maritime confrontation in a month. Beijing claims almost the entire South China Sea, including parts claimed by the Philippines, Brunei, Malaysia, Taiwan and Vietnam. The Permanent Court of Arbitration in 2016 found China's sweeping claims had no legal basis, a ruling Beijing rejects. Portions of the waterway, where $3 trillion worth of trade passes annually, are believed to be rich in oil and natural gas deposits as well as fish stocks. The Philippine Coast Guard said that the China Coast Guard vessel 5205, quote, directly and intentionally rammed the Philippine vessel without provocation. They added that the ramming damaged the Philippines' 320-foot ship, but no one was injured. In a statement, a China's Coast Guard spokesman said a Philippine ship, quote, illegally stranded at the shoal, had lifted anchor and, quote, deliberately rammed a Chinese vessel. He called on the Philippines to withdraw immediately or bear the consequences. And over in Australia now, severe weather plagues the nation. Authorities said more than 120,000 people were left without power after high winds and heavy rain hit southern Australia. Well, parts of Victoria have been told to plan for up to 72 hours without electricity, while bushfires have broken out around New South Wales. 
Emergency services said a 63-year-old woman was killed after a tree fell on a cabin at a holiday park on the state border between Victoria and New South Wales. Victoria State Emergency Services received over 2,800 call-outs overnight, mostly for fallen trees and building damage. At least 121,000 remained without power today, down from as many as 180,000 in the early hours of the morning. Weather warnings remain in place for much of the state's southeast coast as winds of almost 150 km per hour lash the state overnight. The dangerous weather rounds out Australia's hottest August on record with temperatures 3 degrees Celsius above average. Winter's weird warmth shows Australia's climate is entering a different phase. Updates on the Israel-Gaza conflict now. Palestinian Health Authorities and United Nations Agency began a large-scale campaign of vaccinations against polio in the Gaza Strip, hoping to prevent an outbreak in the territory that has been ravaged by ongoing Israel-Hamas war. Well, authorities plan to vaccinate children in central Gaza until Wednesday before moving on to the more devastated northern and southern parts of the Strip. This is what was desperately needed, not just the polio vaccine doses, not just the health professionals capable of carrying out this particularly complicated campaign. The humanitarian pauses, note fighting for eight consecutive hours in specific areas. Israel and Hamas have agreed to this. Gazan families rushed to get their children vaccinated. 640,000 children are set to get a vaccine after the first polio case in 25 years was detected last month. The 11-month patient is one of the babies who did not get their vaccine because of the ongoing violence. Infectious diseases have spread in the enclave in recent months. The campaign is set to be carried out in three phases central, southern and northern Gaza over three to six days, if everything goes according to plan. Meanwhile, tens of thousands of Israelis poured onto the streets of Israel, calling on Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to reach a ceasefire deal with Hamas and demanding he do more to bring home the remaining 101 hostages. The protest comes as six more Israeli hostages were found dead in a tunnel in Rafah. Israel's military recovered the bodies of six people in an underground tunnel in the southern Gaza city of Rafah over the weekend, all of them confirmed as being hostages held captive by Hamas. Five of the six, including one Israeli-American, were taken during the music festival on October 7th. Israel's health ministry says autopsies show that they were killed by being shot at close range between 48 and 72 hours before being found. The death sparked a massive protest in major cities in Israel. Tens of thousands of Israelis poured onto the streets, demanding that leader Benjamin Netanyahu reach a ceasefire deal to bring the remaining hostages back home. The head of Israel's largest labor union also called for a general strike on Monday, demanding that Netanyahu secure the return of hostages. The union wants to shut down or disrupt major sectors of the Israeli economy, including banking, health care and the country's main airport. Thousands of others also gathered outside of the Prime Minister's office in Jerusalem, while the families and relatives of hostages marched with symbolic coffins. Senior Hamas officials said that Israel's refusal to sign a ceasefire agreement to end the 11 months of war was to blame for the deaths. But Prime Minister Netanyahu shifted the blame on Hamas, saying Hamas has refused to agree to any deals since December and rejected a number of U.S.-led deals this year. Well, let's go in for a short commercial break now. More world news on the other side. On the road to the White House now, there are 65 days until America's Election Day on the 5th of November. Well, but if Americans vote like they did in the last two election cycles, most of them will have already cast a ballot before the big day. And on the numbers then, latest polls show Harris is making up lots of speed on voter confidence as some key swing state data revealed her edge up against Trump despite mounting calls for her to meet the press. Early voting starts as soon as September 6th for eligible voters, with seven battleground states sending out ballots to at least some voters the same month. 
It makes the next few months less a countdown to Election Day and more the beginning of election season. States have long allowed at least some Americans to vote early, like members of the military or people with illnesses. In some states, almost every voter casts a ballot by mail. Many states expanded eligibility in 2020 when the COVID-19 pandemic made it riskier to vote in person. Early voting remained popular in the midterms, with 57% of voters casting a ballot before Election Day. Meanwhile, on the numbers end, Harris has a 50% to 46% lead with all registered voters and a 52% to 46% lead with likely voters, essentially unchanged from Harris's four-point edge among registered voters and five-point lead with likely voters two weeks earlier. Harris's interview drought finally ended, but after 43 days as the now official Democratic nominee for president, she has yet to hold an official press conference. Russia targeted Ukraine's northeastern city of Kharkiv, leaving over 40 people injured. This attack comes after Ukraine's drone assault on Russia, which Russian officials have described as one of the heaviest drone attacks by Kyiv since the war began. Rescue teams in Ukraine pulled a man from the rubble after Russian missiles hit a shopping mall and entertainment complex around noon on Sunday. The attack in Ukraine's northeastern city of Kharkiv left at least 47 people injured, including five children. The targets were ordinary civilian structures, a shopping mall, a sports palace and residential buildings. This attack follows Russian officials on the same day reporting damage to industrial sites by a Ukrainian drone attack on several areas including Moscow. Authorities said that Ukraine's drones struck a major power station and an oil refinery, causing fires. Russian officials described this as one of the largest drone attacks by Kyiv since the war began claiming they intercepted over 150 drones overnight. Kiev is yet to comment on the drone attacks. Election updates from Germany now. A far-right party has won a state election for the first time in post-World War II Germany in the country's east and looked to set to finish a very close second in another. The far-right alternative for Germany, or AFD, won 32.8% of the vote in Thuringia, well ahead of the centre-right Christian Democratic Union, the main national opposition party, with 23.6% in regional elections. Ballot in hand, German voters queue up at the polling station. They're voting in the eastern states of Saxony and Thuringia to elect their state parliamentarians. More than three decades after German reunification, polls suggest many in the east are disillusioned with mainstream politics and are choosing to turn to the far right. In Thuringia, polls suggest that the far right alternative for Germany party could come in first place. It's led by Björn Höcker, a man who has repeatedly used banned Nazi slogans at his rallies. In Saxony, it's a closer race, but polls suggest the Conservative CDU holds a slight lead over the AFD. Another unusual feat of this election, the rise of a new populist left party led by hard-left icon Sarah Wagenknecht, projected to finish third in both states. This polling indicates a general rejection of the mainstream and a potential blow to German Chancellor Olaf Scholz's left-leaning coalition government. Even if the AFD does come in first place in both states, most political parties have publicly ruled out any chance of a collaboration, meaning it's unlikely it will form a majority. But the result will be seen as a gauge of voter sentiment ahead of Germany's federal elections in 2025. And finally tonight, Shanghai Museum's new exhibition of Egyptian antiquities has been the cat's meow this summer, attracting hordes of visitors and on certain nights, a furry contingent of around 200 felines who come to prowl among the relics. In a unique tribute to the ancient Egyptian reverence of Bastet, the museum has pioneered an innovative exhibit experience in what it believes is a world first. Visitors are invited to bring their own field and companions to engage with the secrets of Sahara, despite fostering an immersive connection between modern cat lovers and river traditions of the Egypt's past. The initiative has been widely popular, with tickets for cats and humans selling out quickly. And with that, we mark the end of today's bulletin. We will see you again tomorrow with the latest happenings across the globe. Stay tuned as Anuradhe Vikramasinghe will join you next with the Nightly Business Report. Thank you for watching. Have a good night.